connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Doug Maynard, your host for the next hour. Uh, Spark Live, of course, is where we gather each Wednesday to curate and convene and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community uh, with our goal to spark conversation, ideas, and action. And since we are live, I do want to remind everyone, you do have the opportunity to type questions into the question box at any time. Uh, we'll quick check for questions throughout uh, the session, so please don't feel you wait till, to... You d please don't feel you need to wait until the end of the presentation uh, before you type those questions in. Just type them in as you think of them. And also feel free to share your thoughts on Twitter. And if you do, be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. All right. So for today's session, uh, we're going to be talking about how children deserve medications adapted to their needs and why is Canada lagging behind. And so today we're going to learn about how and why children are given adult medications that haven't been modified for their that have been modified for their use despite a lack of data to support how these alterations might affect uh, efficacy and or safety of these data of these uh, pharmaceuticals in the in the uh, pediatric population uh, and we'll and and we're also going to see uh, how the the Goodman Pediatric Formulation Center at the Shu St. Justine is collaborating with stakeholders to develop more safe and effective pediatric drugs and to promote practices to increase the safety and medication safety of medications administered to children uh, and for that we are uh, pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Andrea Gilpin uh, Dr. Gilpin is, was, I don't know if she still considers herself, a scientist uh, in the uh, pharmacolo pharmaceutical pharmacology world uh, with a background in molecular biology and, and biochemistry and spent many years in various pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. And now she's the general manager of the Goodman Pediatric uh, Formulation Center at Shu St. Justine. So it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Andrea Gilpin. Over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Doug, and thanks to Children Healthcare Canada for providing me with the opportunity to share uh, what we do at the Goodman Pediatric Formulation Centre uh, with all of you online. And uh, thanks for your interest in joining the webinar. All right. So I'm just. So you might ask, oh, my, my mouse is very sensitive. <laughs> So why are we here? Um, so the Goodman Pediatric Formulation Center was essentially um, established by two pediatricians at our hospital who um, just could not get over that Canada does not have many of the child formulations that exist in the US and even in Europe, and they just don't come to Canada. They're not commercialized in Canada. And just to be clear, for those of you who may not know what a formulation is, um, you know, every age group has a certain formulation that's appropriate. So in, in, in newborns, it might be a, an IV drip. Um, in most children, the, the gold standard, if any of you have children, it's, it's a liquid a flavor that, uh, or liquid solution that doesn't taste horrible. Um, it could be cherry flavored, banana flavor, but doesn't have to have a flavor. And of course, in adults, generally the gold standard is either uh, capsules or tablets. Um, so, um, so we don't have those liquid formulations. There's many other options, but let's call it liquid formulations in Canada. And oftentimes they do exist elsewhere. And what happens when we don't have the appropriate formulation is that um, because we have to adapt the adult formulation, this can cause therapeutic ineffectiveness. Um, it can increase adverse events or side effects, um, and it can even cause some treatment failure. So 
So I'll give you some true cases here just to give you a flavor of the, the issue. Um, so uh, at the top, we have an eight month liver, old liver transplant recipient. And so this, this family has gone through with a child who needed a new liver. This transplantation process has gone um, perfect, but now the organ needs to be stabilized with a drug called tacrolimus. And tacrolimus is not available in a pediatric formulation in Canada. It actually, uh, it does elsewhere. And so what happens is that parents and caregivers have to actually cut the adult tablet depending on the weight of the child. So it might be cutting a tablet in four or eight, hoping you get the right one and you crush it and you put it in, in water and then you put it in their mouths. And what happens in this case is that tacrolimus is a very narrow therapeutic window. And so, um, you know, it doesn't take much, too much and too little cause uh, serious uh, side effects. And so that's why it would be really important to have that liquid formulation where you can draw up the exact number of mils that you need per the kilogram of child. A second bullet is an 18 month old asthmatic infant is refusing to take his prednisone. Any of you have had a, a child and had to rush them in, uh, to hospital for an asthma attack, um, you'll know that when you come, go home with prednisone, it is terrible, terrible, terrible tasting. And so what's happening in this case is not a therapeutic uh, window effect, but because the, the compounded medication tastes so horrible, children refuse to take it and often it causes a relapse, another emergency uh, trip to the hospital, another admission. And so that can be very, very traumatic. And this could be solved by an appropriately formulated uh, prednisone that doesn't taste horrible. Third bullet is here, the, present, the parents of a three-year-old child with leukemia uh, have to make a cytotoxic medicine at home. And I actually had the pleasure of speaking with a family um, because I, this particular drug we're very, um, we were very concerned about and we've actually reached out to the, the company who makes it. And we had the pleasure of meeting a family who actually unfortunately has a child with um, a leukemia, ALL. And this family had to compound, and that's what that means when you, uh, when you adapt the adult version into a child version, it's called compounding. And so the, for, for two and a half years, they had to take the cytotoxic uh, tablet, cut it in two. They're wearing gowns, they're wearing an apron, they're wearing a face mask in their kitchen. And they're doing this, um, every day for two and a half years. And then they're crushing the tablet, which of course, when you crush a tablet, it can be aerosolized, small particles. Then they were putting it in water and giving it to their child. And so there really is no reason why we in Canada don't have access to that liquid formulation, which would at least minimize exposure to other family members, especially in this particular family's case, the woman um, became pregnant and still had to compound uh, this medication for the child. And last but not least, um, sometimes, although there's a lot of measures in place to ensure that this compounding process is done to the highest quality possible, sometimes errors do occur at the pharmacy. And so the last bullet is talking about a nine-year-old boy in Ontario who unfortunately had a, a baclofen overdose, and he was suffering from um, a sleep disorder and had been administered tryptophan for years. And every month he had to go get his tryptophan prescription that was compounded at the pharmacy. And unfortunately at the pharmacy, they made a mistake. And instead of taking tryptophan to compound it, they actually made a mistake in the bottle and took baclofen. So that poor child um, didn't wake up the next day. Um, so this is showing some true cases, um, not only of why we need it, but also the standard that right now is compounding um, does have faults with it. And we would like to minimize it um, as much as possible. So, and children's, children are not mini adults, and Doug alluded to this a little bit in the introduction. Um, you know, before I started working in pediatrics, I thought it was a simple calculation of a milligram per kilogram. Um, so if you have a 60 kilogram adult and you have a six kilogram child, you just divide that by 10 and it's good to go. But it actually is quite different than that. Um, the different developmental stages of children make them uh, metabolize their drugs differently. Um, they also have variable drug responses depending on what stage they're at. Um, efficacy and safety may not be known or studied when you compound it. So for example, when you take a medication and you compound it and you put it in applesauce, which is very common for, for younger children, uh, you know, does the applesauce acidity, I mean, is it acidic? Does it affect the efficacy? Uh, we don't have those data. Um, and so of course, administration is based on the age group. So there's some age groups where um, really oral is the only way to go. Um, as you get up to the 8, 10, 11, 12 year olds, you might be able to get a, a cat capsule or a tablet uh, down their throat. But even in those age ranges, many, many, many children uh, like, um, like liquid formulations.
So this is all to say that one size does not fit all. Uh, adult formulations may not serve children well. So as I, you know, with the prednisone example, um, we as adults, we can accept a bad taste um, because we know it's good for us. But, and children can to a certain degree, but if it's a, if it's a chronic disease that requires medication every single day for an indefinite period of time, uh, the taste can be very, very, very um, problematic for compliance and adherence to the medication. Also the route of administration and you need absolute dose flexibility. When you think about an 18 year old boy can be, uh, you know, in 70 kilograms and a neonate can be 500 grams. The amount of flexibility you need throughout those weights is, is, is quite appreciable. Um, dosing concentration and volumes are important. Um, so this is an interesting point because sometimes um, we do have a liquid formulation, but the concentration is really off. So it might be really good for neonates, but then when you get to a 10 year old, a 10 year old might have to take uh, 35, 40 mils of something. Um, and so, I mean, although it's good to have the liquid formulation, um, there's also improvements that can be done when, when concentration and volumes don't match, especially if the if the medication doesn't taste really good. A drug excipients is another interesting thing in pediatrics. What we accept as adults in terms of percentage of sugar or percentage of alcohol in the medication is going to be quite different uh, in children and it, that's also going to be weight dependent. So in, in children's medications, we're concerned about tooth decay for somebody who is taking chronically a medication that might have a higher percentage sugar just because they have a smaller body weight. Um, so the excipients, so it's not just the active drug, but the excipients can actually cause um, we need to pay attention to and alcohol levels, of course, um, you know, you don't want um, giving uh, hardly any alcohol to a neonate or any child unless it's necessary, whereas adults can tolerate a little bit more. It has to be easy to dose or else the child won't take it. And of course, um, stability and bioavailability and all and I, all of these uh, different uh, formulations that we use when we compound is not known. Um, one thing we do know is that the, bio, the stability is often much, much shorter. So if you have a, a child that has to take a medication regularly, um, let's say the pharmacy compounds it, that stability might be only six or seven days because it's made right there on, on the pharmacy uh, countertop. Whereas a commercial formulation, often the stability is 18 months. So for those patients that live at a, a remote location, that means uh, weekly trips uh, sometimes to the pharmacy just to get that medication. So the result um, is compounding to adapt the adult forms. And as I in indicated, a lot of these formulations exist in the US uh, and Canada, and even some of them exist in Australia. And Australia has a much smaller um, population than Canada. Um, so what happens is that we're using, uh, we're, we're essentially taking a drug that's approved by Health Canada and adults, and we're using it off label um, to adapt it to a child friendly form. And um, as many as 75% of all pediatric prescriptions may fall outside of regulatory approval in Canada. So the compounding is very, very much commonplace here um, in Canada. So you might ask, uh, and you probably already have asked, why do these formulations not exist in Canada? Um, it's the reason, one of the reasons is that we have a mid to small market size. You know, we're total 7 million kids, most of which are, are healthy, which is a good thing. And so a lot of pharmaceutical companies just look at the, at the market size and they say, well, you know, it's going to take a lot of effort to get it approved and it's not worth it. Um, secondly, our regulatory and, in, and reimbursement path is perceived to be unclear. So in other jurisdictions, they actually have clear steps in for pediatrics. So if you have a pediatric medication, these are the, let's say, 10 things you need to do. Um, in, in At Health Canada, which is the first step of the drug approval process, they don't have any special pediatric um, avenues. Uh, for approval. Um, so often a manufacturer will have to submit with their best guess and then they have to course adjust, which often take, sometimes they ask for more data. Uh, sometimes they don't like the way the label's laid out. So because it's not clear, um, manufacturers look at that and say, well, you know, we're, we're not willing to submit in Canada. But the regulatory hurdles are not the only hurdles because next after re regulatory, um, you have to uh, do the second half of the marathon, which is reimbursement. And reimbursement, depending on the type of drug, um, would mean that you have to go through a federal agency called CADIS, and then if they approve it, if they recommend it, then you still have to go to 10 provinces, three territories, and the federal government. And that is, um, you know, it, I, I'll say it's province by province, but there is a, an organization, an alliance that's trying to streamline that process. So that's why industry is not coming uh, coming in. And on top of that, like uh, unlike in the U.S. and in Europe, we have no incentive. Health, Health Canada provides no incentive for bringing in pediatric medications. So 
even though manufacturers have the data because they have to have it to submit in the US and Europe, they do not submit it in Canada because it'll just it'll make the submission more murky and possibly generate more questions. So we don't have access to the data that's accepted that's already available in other jurisdictions. And in our case, on our priority list of what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the amount of compounding that happens. So one of the things we did at our at our hospital is we looked at what are what how much compounding happens and what are the top 10, 50, 50 drugs that we compound, and we realized that most of them are off patent. So there's no protection. Um, there's no uh, if a, if a company, if a generic company does come into Canada, then the next day they could have their uh, their their innovation in that formulation taken, and there could be competition on the market. Although my personal belief is that would be um, probably. Uh, not likely because they're not coming anyway. So our role at the Goodman Pediatric Formulation Center is really to advocate in these areas, and we want to make the change and facilitate bringing these medications to ch Canadian children. I should say at this point we're a nonprofit, so we we're really trying to do the right thing uh, for the patient and get these medications here in Canada. So I'll go through this um, slide quite quickly, but um, through our, our first three years of existence, we realized that there's really there's really examples of hurdles at every single place in the drug approval process. Um, so this first one, um, Health Canada approval with a drug called levetiracetam, which is an anti-epileptic drug. Again, narrow therapeutic window. We should have access to it, but we don't. Um, so here in this case, Health Canada, um, we had um, a special, um, a regulatory pathway that we could use in adults that we could shift um, to pediatrics, but there was a lot of back and forth with the manufacturer. And, um, and so it hasn't been as easy as we thought because there was a formulation elsewhere. Um, if I move to the next one over the HTA evaluation, um, so we have a drug called propanolol, which is used in infants for hemangioma. And this, this was an interesting example because it got, it got Health Canada approval from the manufacturer. The manufacturer did the required uh, extra studies and it was approved. And then when it came to reimbursement, um, you know, uh, Canada, Cadeth uh, in Canada said, you know, we reimburse it, but we think it's too expensive compared to the compounded medication. And so we think that the manufacturer needs to bring the price down. And in Quebec, which is a different process, um, they refused it and said, we recommend that people continue compounding. Um, the good news on this is that we've now since been able to um, have this product available across Canada in a pediatric formulation, but it took it took some discussions. Next one is six mercaptopurine. So this is an example. This is the example of the little boy with leukemia um, that you'll see in the video coming up. And uh, here's an example where when I went to the manufacturer and said we cannot have parents um, crushing tablets on a, on their kitchen counter for two years. This is this is not acceptable. You know, would you consider coming to Canada? And their answer to me was the regulatory path is unclear. And then at the end of the day, we just want to price it the same as in Australia, the same as in the UK. And we're concerned that if we come to Canada and then they require a really, really low price, then we're going to have to lower our price in the rest of the world. And that will require us to stop manufacturing the product. Um, the next example is amlodipine, which is a cardiovascular drug. In this case, um, again, it's got Health Canada approval, but at the reimbursement level, um, what's happening is that uh, there's debate between two, there's four big provinces and two of the four are viewing the, the, the file one way, which requires more studies, and the other two are accepting it. So again, this shows there's not alignment along um, uh, along every step in the pediatric approval process. Um, tacrolimus we talked about earlier, so that, that the point we want to make here is that compounding, although we've been doing it for probably 100 years, and it is fairly safe, it is not absolutely safe. And where we can get a pediatric formulation, we should. And then the last one, which I won't spend a lot of time on, is that some manufacturers will actually eliminate markets that are, are products that are already on our market in a pediatric formulation because they want to use that capacity for another product. And that's the case with uh, this drug that's called Septra. It's an antibiotic. And we had the pediatric formulation, a liquid pediatric formulation. Then the manufacturer said, oh, we, we want to use that line for something else. So we're discontinuing it. Of course, it's single source. And then uh, so then we had the pediatric tablet that we could compound to the right concentration. And then just last fall, they said, oh, you know, we're going to we're going to get rid of that uh, that um that capsule or that tablet. And so again, then we were able to write uh, and talk to people and now they're gonna keep the capsule on the market. Um, so our mission, uh, so we were established in 2016, as I mentioned, a nonprofit. Um, we are funded completely by philanthropic uh, sources. And our mission is really a better healthcare for ch Canadian children by improving drug safety and accelerating access to medicines that meet their needs. And I should say that of those 
drugs that we prioritized uh, that we need a pediatric formulation, um, the median um, time on the Canadian market in adults has been 35 years. So it's been a long time. So how do we deal with our prioritization list and how are we looking at, at how to contribute to solving the problem? So um, the Goodman Pediatric Formulation Center, there's two things. And the easiest one is to deal with the one on the right, which are new drugs. So the new drugs where you have a company putting in a, 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 a a submission. Um, we are now working with many other pediatric groups, um, including Healthcare Canada, to advocate that new drugs should have um, should be required to submit pediatric uh, data, especially when it's in, uh, already existing elsewhere or it's already being generated for other markets. And we're trying to find ways to create a favorable environment. So in other words, try to create incentives to encourage the pediatric dossier to be um, either manufacturers could do it on their own or we will require them to do it. Um, that is at the upper at levels of regulation change. And so that will take a long time. But I do know that Health Canada is, um, is, is talking about it and they seem interested in working with us to get that done. Uh, on the other side, the old off-patent drugs, that's more challenging because, again, there's no patent um, and obviously the markets are very, very small here in Canada. So the first thing we ask ourselves, is there a pediatric formulation that exists elsewhere other than Canada? If the answer is yes, then we try to um, obtain these formulations um, by not only uh, in the past, we were helping manufacturers. Um, so we would go to Health Canada with them. We would bring a, a pediatrician. We would bring a patient. We try to show why, from a patient perspective, this is important to have this drug on the market. And on, on the second hand, also, we're trying to advocate um, for a favorable environment. How can we change the environment so these very low-margin old products can come to Canada, especially when they're elsewhere? On the other side, if there is not a pediatric formulation available outside of Canada, then how can we partner and innovate uh, with other uh, companies to try to bring um, new maybe uh, formulations, uh, develop a new gold standard? And so this requires a favorable research uh, environment. And continuing on the no trend, there will be some that will never, it'll never be, it will never be able to commercialize or have a commercial formulation, and and that's just a reality. And so in that case, then it would be it would be good to just optimize um, the compounding. So right now, and I'll just talk a little bit about this compounding right now, every single hospital, every single pharmacist will have their own recipe. Um, I like to use the example that I have my own recipe for spaghetti sauce. And so do all of you. Well, this is the same thing. We all call it spaghetti sauce, but it's all it can be all quite different. So the same thing with the optimizing the compounding uh, at the pharmacy. So um, we're working with a, the Canadian Pediatric Society and a group in Winnipeg. Peg, and the goal is if we can find funding is to really try to just standardize um, how these recipes are made and then we will reduce the errors because sometimes the hospital will use a two milligram per milliliter um, concentration but then the, the local pharmacist the community pharmacist will use one milligram per milliliter and because parents generally focus on volume not concentration that can cause uh, some error in that and although we tell the parents the hospital pharmacist tells the parents it's just a room for error that, that we don't really uh, we don't really need so here's our strategy. This is actually hot off the press. We've just revamped our strategy. We took a pause to learn about what, what was working and what was not working from the first three years of our existence, because what we're doing is quite novel in Canada, and it's actually quite novel in the world, because we're really trying to take it from a patient-centric perspective and moving it upwards to industry. Uh, many other models are quite the inverse. Um, and so we finalized our strategy, uh, I would say, just a couple weeks ago. And our strategy for the next three years are going to rest on these four pillars. So the first one is advocacy. So we need to adv continue our advocacy efforts with um, all the other um, uh, pediatric groups across Canada, um, with the federal government, with Health Canada, with um, health technology associations. Um, but also, we also need to do some in every province. And of course, we are in Quebec, but we have many other provinces where we need uh, people to start advocating at the local process, because the last step in this whole process is will the, will the drug plan accept this um, new drug and reimburse it for the public plans. That is the last step. So we do need uh, all the 10 provinces to be um, on board. And so that, we haven't done much on the provincial front. We've been working more on the federal front, but the, the provincial front, um, we need to um, also advocate. And one last point I'll make on the provincial side is that the point of view, once you get to the province to get it on your OE hip card or here in, in, in Quebec, it's the RAMQ card, um, 
the 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 parameter is you know how is this going to imp impact my budget and of course this is really important for all of us as taxpayers because we want to make sure that the drugs we give for free it makes sense and um, it's reasonable given the other products on the market um, but in this case what what the reimbursement agencies are, are saying is that well we're comp the comparator for pediatric formulations is really going to be uh, the compounded medication and that's where a lot of education, we need to generate a lot of education because you can't compare it to the compounded medication. It just doesn't have the same standards as a commercialized formulation. Moving on to the second pillar, which is the yellow pillar. This is where we need people in the pediatric community to really come together and um, really support the cause. And so this is where we're trying to, uh, with several other groups, including healthcare, health, uh, health, uh, Children Healthcare Canada um, and the Canadian Pediatric Society and MyCERN and KidScan. We're trying to work with all these groups to really have a single voice. And I'm very, very happy to say uh, that we were at a meeting uh, with um, senior levels of the health, uh, pol health food, uh, food branch just last Friday. And they said that their impression was that we were a very fragmented community, but that in the last maybe couple of years that we're really coming together, we're coming with the same message as to Health Canada and to the health technology assessment. So the working together is working and we're advancing and there have been changes, concrete changes at Health Canada that, uh, that let us know that we're listening to them. So all the work that we do together really is important. Um, the third pillar, which is the red pillar, is um, pharma industry commitment. Of course, uh, in, industry provides two things. First of all, uh, they have all the knowledge to commercialize a drug, and they also have the financial capability to do it. So this, this cannot happen without them being around the table. So in, in the case, what, how we've been interacting with uh, industries, we've been trying to um, sensitize them to some of the needs in Canada, trying to facilitate, encourage um, some of these medications to come into Canada. And ultimately, we'd like their commitment that if we're able to change the regulations um, to uh, certain to have certain things that are pediatric specific, can they then bring their medications, uh, commercialize their medications into Canada? And last but not least, um, we continue to expand and expand our knowledge and expertise and innovation. Um, you know, we need to continue to uh, understand the area. We need to continue um, to uh, get data so people understand what the problem is with more concrete data. We have a lot of anecdotal, but now, so now we have about seven studies ongoing at the Goodman Pediatric um, Center to uh, better understand, uh, you know, how, how, how much compounding is done of our 50 top prioritized med medications, how many different recipes are out there. Um, so there's a number of studies that we're doing for that kind of more academic um, interests. And on innovation, we actually have partnered with a company in Germany and we're exploring, exploring um, using a drug that has a very narrow therapeutic window um, as a, a film. So if any of you have used those kind of breath mints, they're like tape that you put on your tongue and then dissolves instantly. It will be a similar, it's called an oral dispersible film. It would be put on the side of the child's cheek. And then because it would um, disperse into the side of the cheek, there's, there's medically a lot of advantages to that. And um, so, but this would be, I think that Health Canada has only ever approved one other medication that's like that, and that's uh, in adults and for migraines. So these are examples where we're trying to bring out new innovation in the area. So we do, our, our, our real mandate is to, is to facilitate the development and market authorization of pediatric drugs in two ways. We want to act as a change agent to improve the clinical regulatory um, access policies and procedures. So that's the, the part I was talking about simplifying and at least being able to tell people or industry, you know, these are the 10 steps you need for Health Canada approval. These are the 10 steps you need for HTA approval. Um, and we want to develop partnerships to provide access to these much needed formulations on our priority list. So how can we partner with industry um, to bring these medications? And so improving access to the appropriate marketed formulations for children um, is important. And as I said, what's unique about the way we're doing this is we're really taking it from the bedside and moving Moving through the system going up to um, industry. So our partner, our partnership progress to date, um, we have amlodipine and le levetiracetam, which we've partnered with in 2016, and uh, both of them have been submitted to Health Canada. And our and, and amlodipine specifically was approved this January. Levetiracetam is still under review, and um, we have a European collaboration, which I just talked about, um, to for that oral dispersible film uh, in the side of the cheek of the of the patient. 
On the advocacy front, uh, we have been quite busy. We've responded to six advocacy letters in 2018. Um, and here we're trying to hit on some major themes. So we want a clear pediatric path for regulatory approval. We would like special fees so that it's less um, than a regular file to submit for pediatric uh, formulations. And then we would like um, some sort of accelerated or priority review. Um, so those are the three major things we've been uh, we've been advocating for. And on the right, you see, we've also been involved on the national pharmacare um, uh, discussions. Uh, we've, we've met with the minister involved, Minister Hoskins, and we've also written a letter uh, to demonstrate cases to show why it's important to think that the national pharmacare should have pediatric specific uh, considerations. Um, so this is a big win for us that happened just recently. Um, this is a, a draft guidance, so it's not final, it's draft, but uh, it's actually talking about um, accelerated review, the criteria for accelerated review. This is for all populations. And here um, we had um, we had a sentence that said that pediatric formulations could uh, apply for accelerated review. So this was uh, an, an example where we've actually, we're moving towards change. It's slow, but we're, uh, we're taking baby steps and we're getting there. We're ne networking with key stay stakeholders. Uh, we've worked with some others internationally, but I try to keep these more uh, local uh, in Canada. Uh, and you can see the, the various partnerships that uh, we've established and really to try to you know, get that united voice and have at least the top few messages being the same and how each organization um, kind of makes it their own is, is great, but having a uni united voice moving forward. Um, so we're a non we're a nonprofit. In our interactions with the files we've had with both HTA associations and with um, Health Canada, what they appreciate about us is that we're a nonprofit. We're not uh, the same uh, industry could say the same thing, and because they're profit motive, they don't. It doesn't have the same weight. Um, and because we have knowledge in all of these areas, um, we're able to uh, really put forth um, an. Un we, we try to put an unbiased point of view, uh, an impartial way to our suggestions to policy change. Um, and in so doing, we really hope to increase the safety, um, not only by increasing, uh, reducing compounding where possible, because then we'll have the commercial formulation available here in Canada but also because when, we're, when we will be compounding, then, um, then at least it'll be more standardized. So we've been adding value to the Canadian market uh, by really bringing together a network of uh, health uh, care practitioners. So what we've been doing is been in each therapeutic area in which we work, we try to ha develop a network across the country so that if we're asked to go to Health Canada for an expert opinion, then we can bring somebody who has, who knows patients in this area and can explain why uh, not having the commercial formulation is, is challenging from a patient, a caregiver, a physician, a nurse perspective. Um, so um, I've already addressed that point. Um, yeah. And so, and of, of course, when we have this priority list, the ability to advocate for that, that list um, is also because then you become specific. When we initially started, we didn't have that list. And um, we were told, really, you need to have, uh, it has to be case by case, and we'll learn together. And so that's, uh, that's what we're doing. So at this point, I have a video, and this video um, will show you from a patient and a caregiver perspective, um, the challenges. The video is just over five minutes. Um, the little girl has a brain cancer, and the little boy has um, leukemia. And it's the little boy who has leukemia that's taking that product, 6 mercaptopurine, where his parents had to compound it on the kitchen counter um, every single day for about two and a half years. So I'll pass it back over uh, to you, Doug. All right, thanks, uh, Andrea. So we'll just play this video real quick here. Noé euh, a été diagnostiqué euh, pour une leucémie à l'âge de 2 ans. Euh, en fait, on est rentré à l'hôpital pour un, un mal à la cheville. On ne comprenait pas trop ce qu'il avait. Puis, euh, on est allé aux urgences à l'hôpital Sainte-Justine. Euh, puis, finalement, on est rentré le 26 septembre 2014. Puis, euh, on est ressorti un mois plus tard. Je suis Laurent, ma conjointe, c'est Elise, et nous sommes les, les parents de, de Noé. C'est sûr, c'est quelque chose qui, qui arrive dans, dans notre famille. On n'est pas vraiment préparé pour ça. 
et qu'on s'est retrouvé du, du jour au lendemain avec une grosse quantité de médicaments à administrer, donc il y avait beaucoup de préparation. Ça prenait finalement des temps dans la journée pour, pour préparer ça. La première fois qu'on est sorti de l'hôpital, je pense qu'on est sorti avec deux énormes sacs pleins de, de différents médicaments qu'on a ramenés à la maison. On a entreposé ça dans, dans, des, dans des caisses, puis à chaque fois qu'on avait besoin, c'était comme un petit laboratoire, on allait préparer en fait les, les différents médicaments. Lilia Carole a été euh, diagnostiquée, euh, en fait, ils ont découvert une tumeur au cerveau le 19 septembre 2013. Elle a fait de la radiothérapie pendant euh, six semaines. Puis ensuite, quand ils ont fait un autre résonance magnétique, euh, ça avait fonctionné. La tumeur, elle avait beaucoup rétréci, mais ça avait poussé dans la moelle épinière. Julie Vallière, maman de Lilia Carole, trois ans. Le médecin nous a rappelé, puis il nous a dit qu'il avait trouvé, euh, il y avait peut-être des options de chimio expérimentale. Ça a fonctionné, en fait, là, ça fait, je, je pense que là, ça va être le 18e cycle qui a fait. Là. Lilia euh, reçoit une fois par mois, elle vient à la clinique d'oncologie pour euh, recevoir ses traitements de chimiothérapie. Puis dans le cadre de Lilia, mais elle a un médicament qu'elle doit prendre à tous les jours, du lundi au vendredi. Marie-Hélène Colpron, infirmière pivot de Lilia Carole. Ce qui nous pose problème dans, dans la situation avec Lilia, c'est que c'est un médicament par la bouche qu'elle doit prendre, qu'elle doit avaler. Et euh, dans le cas de Lilia, ce n'est pas, pas nécessairement facile parce qu'elle est tout petite. La chimie, en fait, c'est euh, des capsules. Et vu qu'elle a trois ans, elle est beaucoup trop jeune pour avaler les capsules encore. Euh, dans le fond, il faut ouvrir les capsules, puis on mélange la poudre dans du jus de pomme. Euh, depuis ce temps-là, elle déteste vraiment le jus de pomme. <rire> Euh, ça goûte euh, terrible, 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 terrible. Ça goûte euh, comme, euh, comme le fer, mais fois mille. <rire> euh, c'est sûr qu'à son âge, elle est beaucoup trop jeune pour comprendre que euh, c'est pour son bien. Puis là, surtout qu'elle vieillit, elle exprime beaucoup plus de choses. Elle dit, euh, j'en veux pas des médicaments, ça goûte pas bon, puis euh, elle pleure, elle se débat. Je me souviens que j'ai souvent eu la remarque avec la maman Lilia Cara, mais pourquoi ce médicament-là n'est pas, est pas en liquide? Pourquoi, est pas, pourquoi ça goûte ça? Pourquoi il euh, n'y a pas une façon plus facile de le donner? Parce qu'on s'entend que Lilia, elle est capable de le prendre par la bouche. Difficilement, mais elle le prend. Mais c'est déjà arrivé pour ce même médicament-là qu'on a dû utiliser parce que l'enfant refusait de le prendre, mais installer des mesures comme installer un tube nasogastrique. Quand on a deux ans, je pense que c'est vraiment difficile. Déjà, on ne comprend pas ce qui nous arrive. Puis après ça, nos parents nous, nous donnent des médicaments à prendre en grosse quantité. On sait que tous ces médicaments-là, euh, nous, il ne faut pas qu'on qu en, qu en absorbe. Fait que pour nous, c'est vraiment comme des, des poisons. Puis on préparait ça avec des gants, avec des masques, on a tout plein de précautions. Puis finalement, on va lui, lui injecter ça directement dans, dans son corps à lui. Donc c'est sûr que c'est un peu... Euh, on trouve ça un peu bizarre finalement. On a l'impression de l'empoisonner. C'est... Euh, non, parce que c'est sa médicamation, mais nous on le vit un peu comme ça. On lui donne des choses qui ne sont pas forcément bonnes euh, pour, pour notre corps. C'est pas naturel comme... Euh, comme geste, en fait. fait ça, c'est un peu difficile à vivre comme parent. C'est déjà pas facile pour un enfant de 3 ans de comprendre qu'il faut prendre des médicaments. C'est important, on ne traite pas un mal de tête, on, on traite les soins qui est agressif. On a un traitement, on a un traitement agressif. Il faut le donner, mais à quel prix? Lilia, Lilia. C'est sûr que la création de ce genre de centre est vraiment bien accueillie par les parents, les parents comme nous, puis les enfants, parce que tout le travail qui va pouvoir être fait pour améliorer cette prise de médicaments, que ce soit sur le goût, sur la forme, euh, ça va être quelque chose qui va être vraiment bénéfique euh, pour l'enfant. Ça va être moins contraignant de, de lui administrer les, les médicaments, puis quelque part, pour la famille, ça va être aussi plus facile. C'est terrible pour, pour un parent d'avoir à tenir son enfant puis de le forcer à faire quelque chose que... Déjà là, avoir à dealer avec la maladie au quotidien, c'est terrible, mais avec les médicaments aussi... Fait que oui, la création d'un centre comme ça, pour moi, c'est pour ça que j'ai accepté aussi de, de participer à, à tout ça, parce que c'est vraiment merveilleux. J'ai comme pas d'autres mots. Ça serait ça. Ça serait merveilleux si vraiment ils découvrent des, 
toutes des façons de faire. Là. Ouais. Ça va rendre beaucoup de vie plus facile. Well, my thank you slide is not showing up right now, but um, what I what I just wanted to thank you for your attention, and I'm now um, I can open up for questions. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you uh, for a great presentation. I mean, and, and especially for that that video at the end, that was so powerful. Watching what those families have to deal with. I mean, I've certainly heard the stories, but hearing it at least in video form in their own voices. I mean, it's just an, an incredible story. Um, so uh, as, as we said earlier, this is your chance to uh, ask, uh, ask any questions. Go ahead and type them into the question box. Um, but I, I just I did just want to say I, I, I don't I don't know if people realize how much work is is going on behind the scenes and it's great to have a center like like the the like your center like the Goodman Pediatric Formulation Center who's sort of leading a lot of this work at the advocacy level at the federal level but uh, my CERN the Maternal Infant Child and Youth uh, Research Network uh, with their Clinical Trials Consortium the Kids Can Clinical Trials uh, Center uh, the research institutes across the country through my CERN are working with uh, CIHR the Canadian Institute for Health Research to streamline the ethics process so that these studies can happen because that's, that's only one of the barriers. I mean, you certainly laid out uh, the issue around the regulatory process and the burden that's there and the cost and the economic issue. But part of it are for centers that are interested in doing these studies on these medications to, uh, to get the evidence around efficacy in children and safety. Uh, it's still difficult to do those studies in, in, in children in Canada just because of ethics issues and provincial barriers across the system, et cetera. So there's just so many moving parts of this issue. Uh, and it's great to have a center like yours who's sort of doing some coordination at least to sort of pull some of these stakeholders together. Together, as you said so uh, so just great work um, oh, thank you <clears throat> and you're right there's many research uh, there's a lot of research being done, being done across the country and I, I think the beauty is that somehow the moons are just aligning and we're all coming together with um, it may not be one single voice but it's it's very close to one single voice and that's where we're having the impact and it goes from research you know all the way to you know the commercialization so it's it's very it feels like you know it could be very powerful if we continue to move in that direction uh, so we do have a number of questions that have come in. Um, Blair, who's a pharmacist in Saskatoon, is asking, he said he's followed the progress of, of the GPFC, of your center. Uh, right. he, and he's asking what transpired with the mini tablets initiative with Europe. And maybe you could give us a little background on that, because I'm not sure. I, hopefully you know what he's talking about, but I, I know I don't. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for the question, Blair. Um, yes, so uh, mini tabs are also, I, I talked about the oral dispersible film, uh, but mini tabs, um, they're, um, for those of you who aren't aware, they're very, very tiny, tiny, tiny little um, tablets. And they're so small that in an infant, you might just give one. Uh, and then for a 10 year old, you might be able to give 10. And so we actually had a symposium on that last May, uh, a year ago, with the expert who not only makes, who works with the manufacturer to manufacture mini tablets, but he also worked with the researcher who uh, did a clinical trial. Her name is Vivian Klingman, and she did uh, um, clinical trials with placebo just to see the acceptability of mini tabs. And it turned out even in young children, the mini tabs were very, very well accepted. So mini tabs are um, absolutely a, of interest to us. Um, it's uh, it, more, it was more of a research project, and uh, it's something we would like to support, but we're not we're not able to lead it because we don't have any research facilities. Um, in our center. Of course, we work within a hospital center that has a research center, um, but we, we're not quite there doing the research ourselves yet. All right. Um, the next question is uh, just, just part question, part comment, uh, is saying, as pharmacists are considered medication experts, she's just wondering why there's no specific stakeholder engagement from pharmacy groups at a national level. And and, and maybe there is, or maybe it's just not activity we're aware of. But are, are you aware of any activity from sort of national level pharmacy groups that are addressing this issue? This issue? Yeah, so we've been talking to the Association um, of Phar Hospital Pharmacists. That's where we started. And so we've been uh, speaking with uh, Barry Power. He actually attended our um, workshop that we had uh, jointly with many of the stakeholders and um, and the CPS, the Canadian Pediatric Society. And coming out of that, um, that organization is endorsing uh, the recommendations we have for Health Canada. So um 
I, we certainly believe that pharmacists have to be around the table and they have to be leaders in this area because I don't think any one stakeholder can do it by themselves. Uh, and even if I, I talk about the team here at St. Justin, uh, you know, we work very, very closely with the hospital pharmacists. Um, once we're understanding more about the challenges in the hospital pharmacy, then our intent is to move and understand more about the community, community pharmacists. We're a really small team, so we can only do things once at a time. But we understand the reality of the community pharmacists is quite different uh, than the hospital pharmacists. But for the pharmacists on uh, on the call or attending the webinar, if this is of interest to you and um, you would like to uh, reach out to me, we would be happy um, to uh, continue to add pharmacists across the country in this initiative. All right. I, I had a little deja vu earlier in your presentation. Our, our former CEO, Elaine Orbine, who many in the audience know, uh, used to say children are not little adults about at least 10 times a day. And she used to also say, you don't just knock off a few kilograms and milligrams. And you, you, know, you used both of those lines in your presentation, which was great. And it just sort of speaks to the issue of raising awareness around that issue. It, it, the advocacy piece of this is so important, particularly, as you said, at the federal level, not to even mention what happened, what then would have to happen at the provincial level. Uh, but the next comment is just sort of along that line, just saying there seems to be an ongoing need for awareness raising. Uh, and he sort of put in a second comment. He says, unless people are paying attention, we won't be able to get on the uh, get the agenda on the radar of Ottawa. You know, I get that, again, that's a message that children Healthcare Canada, and formerly as CAFC, has been sort of banging that drum for you know, since our inception. That's one of the reasons we were created to sort of send that children are not little adults uh, sort of message. But his question goes on to ask, what's the plan for that raising awareness and who else can contribute? Yeah, so uh, we want to partner with groups like uh, Children Healthcare Canada to, again, ha unify that voice. Uh, we cannot lobby because we're a hospital. Um, so there's, there, you know, build on each other's strengths. We, um, in the near future, we're publishing two policy papers. Uh, and they'll be published in um, the Canadian Pediatrics Journal uh, in mid-July. And one is on regulatory reform. And uh, the one on regulatory reform is the one where we, uh, for the first time actually, had brought pharmacists and pediatricians in a room to talk about the challenges of pediatric formulations. And then we also added a representative from uh, regulation, not somebody from Health Canada, but somebody with regulatory expertise that could you know, explain to us some of the questions we had early in that project. And then we also had somebody from CADIS. So the um, health technology assessment person, um, the VP of research at the time was was there to provide us, you know, information on how they view reimbursement and how they make those uh, HTA, this health technology assessment decisions. Um, so out of that came the policy paper, which will be published in four weeks. And in the second policy paper, um, we are uh, putting, uh, basically talking about national pharmacare and how we need pediatric specific um, criteria for that national pharmacare. So in the first step, those two uh, are going out of the gate in July, and that's where we're going to start raising awareness. Um, the first regulatory policy paper was endorsed by 12 uh, organizations. Many of the ones that Doug uh, mentioned are in, in, in endorsing that um, uh, that policy paper. So the idea is once it's published, uh, then uh, because we co the GPFC co-wrote it jointly with uh, Canadian Pediatric Society, we're going to go out, but we're also going to provide messaging for all those 12 endorsing organizations to also make noise within their networks as much as they can. So that's the first step. Um, and the second step is that um, we're going to try to to, well, we're going we're gonna to develop a media campaign um, in the fall and try to really create awareness to use, using families and patients um, to explain that, you know, we really could improve in this area. To a great start, especially with that video as a as a as a as a campaign tool. I mean, that video is so so powerful that for people to understand what these families are dealing with in in preparing these toxic medications on their kitchen counter is uh, it's hard to believe that it's actually real. Yeah, and and if I can I can ask anybody on the on the webinar if you have patient stories or you know of patient stories that uh, with consent they'd be willing to contact me. Um, the more of these patient stories we get, the more the easier it's going to be to hook in uh, public awareness and the media um, later this fall because I think it's really the patient story that makes the difference. Um, the next question is asking. Uh, it's sort of related to the special access program. Um, 
which uh, if people aren't aware, there's a special way that medications that can go around the, the approval process for a short term while they're while things are in process. And maybe you can give a better explanation of that program than I just did. But um, she's asking, is there any advocacy efforts with Health Canada to allow for liquid formulations to come into the country through the special access program? Uh, they often reject requests for liquid formulations to be approved through this program because of the availability of compounded products. For example, she uses the example of uh, tacro tacrolimus. Right, um, yeah. That's the same drug I was talking about for the transplantation. Um, the special access program, although we, uh, you know, we obviously are aware it's a it's a vehicle for industry to bring in drugs, and for those on the line who are not aware, it's really case by case. So every single patient uh, needs to put in paperwork. The physician needs to put in paperwork to Health Canada, and Health Canada will release a drug um, on a case by case basis. So the intent was to provide access to drugs um, where there's no other options, but the idea was also that it should not be large volumes. Um, we have not um, actually focused on uh, advocacy for the special access program. It's not yet on our radar. And the the, the challenge you're outlining with the liquid formulation, um, so I, we haven't done it yet. Um, I mean, if you are willing to send me an email and describe to me the problem, we can take a look and see if we can fit that in as part of our advocacy, um, because I think it's worth it. The special access program as, as a program has not been uh, the first priority for us. It's really trying to get these medications that exist elsewhere in Canada. You said the issue with the uh, the special access program is it is just a one-off thing. It's something that you have to do for each individual medication that you have an issue with, and and that's not really a long-term solution, anyways. We want something more substantial and more uh, sort of upfront, as opposed to making one-off requests all the time. And uh, you know, I've been part of uh, consultations with uh, I think it was the Ministry of Health in Ontario. I think it was a provincial ministry. Uh, it might have been federal government. I can't remember. It was quite a while ago where they were talking about um, making a special special exception for uh, drugs related to um, addiction disorders uh, at the height of as the as the opioid crisis was coming in and and so they were talking about making special access to these drugs that were already approved in Canada and the United or in the United States and Europe and on but they would have been used, they would still would have been off label for children. And in this case, we would have been talking about uh, older youth, uh, teenagers that might potentially yeah. need access to these drugs. And unless someone like me or another pediatric person happened to be in the room, they would not have considered children at all. When I raised the, the issue of will the, would these drugs be considered off label and would they qualify under the special access? The question hadn't even come up. They were dumbfounded at, at, at the thought that children would ever even need these drugs. And when you start talking about 16, 17 and 18 year olds that are potentially dealing with addictions, the light bulbs start going on. Uh, but again, unless somebody's in the room at the time for these special access programs, the, the children are they're, they're not even on the radar at all. As was said earlier, they just don't they don't even get on the radar. All right. So with uh, with that, uh, we do uh, we don't have any more questions in the list. If you do have uh, any sort of last questions, we do have a couple more minutes that we could take them. So if you're rapidly typing them in on the on the uh, on the keyboard, we will we will try to accept uh, one or one or two more if they do come in. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, uh, Dr. Gilpin has her uh, information, her contact information up on the screen. So as she has said, there's a few people that she's invited to follow up with her around uh, patient stories or uh, other uh, other questions that you might have related to the presentation so please do go ahead and contact her uh, that being said no more questions have come in so maybe we'll just go back to you one more time uh, Andrea for uh, you know just to, any closing messages you'd like to oh one more question did come in she said oh, a comment she said access to view okay. yeah, I'm not a pharmacist you can see access to buprenorphine formulation for neonatal absence and abstinence syndrome would be helpful so there you go <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I can say the uh, that that um, medication is. Uh, I'm working with actually a neonatologist in Calgary, uh, Terry Lacaz. Uh, it's on our list, and we're aware that what's happening with that could be uh, significantly improved. Oh, there you go. All right. So sounds good. All right. So we'll just go back to you one more time. Any closing messages, key messages you'd like to leave the audience with or anything that any sort of call to action, anything you'd like to invite the audience to do that anything tangible that they can do as a next step to help support this cause? Just anything you'd like to leave the audience with before we sign off? Um, sure. Uh, but first of all, I really want to thank uh, very much uh, Children Healthcare Canada, not only for providing the opportunity 
uh, to uh, talk about the Goodman Pediatric uh, Center, but also, uh, you know, for, for the collaborations we've done and, and will do in the future. Uh, I really appreciate that. And um, Children's Healthcare Canada is really doing great work. Uh, and so uh, you need to continue doing what you're doing. We all need to continue. I guess my, my closing remarks would be, you know, the more that we can unite and do things together, the better it is. So if any of you have any ideas, uh, if, as I said, patient stories are, are what we're looking for, or if you know um, pharmacists and pediatricians across the country where this is a real passion for them, um, then, you know, we're trying to expand that network because what we want to do this fall is really create a surround sound across the, the country. Um, and of course, um, the last uh, ask is if you happen to know any um, people in the medical community that maybe are also local politicians in your areas that have a passion for pediatrics, um, that also could help us in our plans for the fall. All right. And with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thanks again for a great presentation, a real important topic that I don't think uh, hopefully more people now realize is how big this issue is. I think some people realize, you know, when it, when they're dealing with it, they realize it's an issue. But if if, if, if you haven't been confronted with it, you don't realize how big of a problem this is. So I think uh, you're, you also are continuing to do good work in this area. So thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. All right. Uh, so we do our webinars usually every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and when you do get to watch live, you get to ask your questions and put, and include your comments. Uh, but when you can't, we do record the presentation and make it available after the fact. And everyone that's uh, signed in here will receive a link to that in a couple of days. We also have the uh, in the handout section there uh, a, cop a PDF copy of the slides that were used today if you want to use those. Uh, however, that being said, this is the last webinar for this season. Uh, we do always take a little hiatus over the summer and we will be returning uh, back in September with another round of interest interesting topics, including uh, uh, sessions focused on patient safety, mental health, Indigenous health services for children and youth, uh, innovations in neurodevelopmental services, and many other things that we've already got in the in the works uh, for the next year's schedule. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, including Dr. Gilpin, but all of our speakers over the last uh, several months. It's been a really good uh, season. We've had some of our largest audiences ever, uh, so it's really great to see the audience grow and, and that people are enjoying what we're doing here. So thanks to everyone who's participated, both our audience and our speakers. And I'd also like to thank uh, Lisa Stromquist and Ann Watkins, who step in when I'm not available, and also Andrew Tomeyer, who's uh, been helping produce this uh, series over the last, uh, I'm not sure how many months, years that he's been doing this. But unfortunately, Andrew's leaving us, so we wish him uh, uh, all the best as he moves on to a new career uh, with the Conference Board of Canada that he'll be starting in a couple weeks. Uh, so uh, thanks again to Andrew for all his help. And just one last reminder to uh, sign up for our Children's Healthcare Canada Spark newsletter to stay up to date on all of our activities. And you can find that uh, just by going to childrenshealthcarecanada.ca and right at the bottom of the page, you'll see a little uh, box where you can sign up for the newsletter. So thanks again for joining us today and we hope you all have a great summer and we'll see you back here hopefully in September. Bye everyone. Mm -hmm.